Welcome. Welcome to the Ralph Bevins Project. My name is Ralph Bevins. We're here today to talk about growth, development, the future of our city, the future of our country, what's going on with new projects and commercial real estate and development. And we're lucky today to have Preston Young here. Preston is with, he's now National Head of Office Investor Services at Spring Realty Partners, which is has a major presence in Texas, and, and they're also on both coasts and in cities, and they're growing. So uh, he, he knows a lot about what's happening. We just want to start off and say, hey, Preston, you've worked a long time in Houston. You developed a building in Houston, and uh, just right across the street from where I am, uh, BBVA, which is pretty new, work, just by the Galleria. Everybody, it's kind of a landmark along that street. And um, but what's the state of affairs with with the Houston commercial real estate market? Uh, we know we have COVID, we had COVID problems. The energy industry has had its problems, and so what's the state of affairs here today? Where are we going? You know, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, depending on how long your podcast is, we could we could go for hours on this answer alone. But uh, you know. I, I think that, you know, the state of affairs in in Houston, it's similar to, you know, in some respects to what we're seeing across the country right now, where, you know, we're just plagued by vast amounts of uncertainty. You know, you look at at, um, all the events that took place in 2020, um, the presidential election, uh, the civil unrest, um, obviously everything kind of tied to COVID. If, If it was just one of those events, that would define a year. Um, but we saw three, four, maybe even five of these kind of life altering events all kind of dovetail together over a six to nine month period. So uh, Houston, like the rest of the country, was shell shocked um, in terms of you know how to deal with you know the pandemic first and foremost and um, started to kind of get back to some level of normalcy, as you know. Uh, after summer, but then, you know, we started seeing a rise in cases again. Um, so as you know, in financial markets, whether that's equities or real estate bonds, uncertainty always is negative. It's never positive. It's always mm-hmm. negative. Um, but yeah. So uh, right now, when you look at the state of Houston, that's we're, we're sitting in that same boat, like, like the rest of the country, you know, unfortunately we, we were mired with, the incredibly low oil prices for the last five years prior to the pandemic. Um, and so we, we saw, a, you know, a swath of bankruptcies, clearly a lot of sublease space at all time, historical highs. Uh, but we were starting to kind of bounce back from that. And, you know, fourth quarter of 19, first quarter of 20, we were starting to feel relatively bullish again. We were seeing companies expand and uh, starting to take down space. We were seeing that sublease, um, you know, start to really kind of come down a pretty significant degree. We're even talking about development in a few select areas of the, of the city. But uh, obviously we, we all took a huge collective step back with what was going on um, with the pandemic that, you know, could be a, um, you know, a death blow to, to many um, oil and gas companies within Houston right now. So um, I think that long-term though, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on Houston. Uh, it, what's interesting to me, Ralph, is that if you look at 2014 to 2019, you know, over that five-year period, which most of that was was a really rough time in Houston, um, that Harris County MSA, or Harris County in particular, was the second fastest growing county in the country, only behind Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, over that same time frame. So, I think that really illustrates the fact that this is not the 80s all over again where we're tied exclusively to energy. Um, so in spite of, of everything that was thrown at us in the energy world, um, you know, we were still able to have a pretty substantial population growth increase, which just really illustrates the diversity of our economy. Unfortunately, a lot of the office jobs are still tied to oil and gas. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I think you even commented recently that, you know, some people comparing Houston to Detroit, and Houston is certainly no Detroit. 
uh, the innovation that's in this town, uh, the, the population growth that we're seeing in and of itself, uh, the Texan can-do spirit, all that combined is going to put Houston well ahead uh, into the future. Yeah, we just, we just don't know how long it, we look at all this office space that's available, it's considerable, considerable amount. We can't think, how long will it take to, how long will it take to get this, these buildings refilled and leased? And, right. And it can take a while, you know. I don't see any energy companies doing any expansion. So we keep thinking maybe there'll be a big influx from somewhere, from somebody, from some sector that could grow here. I hope so. I hope so. But I, I don't know how long that will take. I mean, there's certainly the, the those those headline splashes that everybody loves to see where all of a sudden there's 10,000 new jobs to a region. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, given what we've seen, the net out migration in California, New York, Houston, mm -hmm. very well could benefit from another HP announcement and, and see that. Um, but I think we all need to remember that two thirds of all jobs, you know, come from, you know, companies that are, you know, much smaller than the Fortune 500 companies. Um, and that's the backbone of our economy. And if you look at Houston, Houston is awash with those types of companies because of the innovation, because of the culture that's here. Um, so I, as much as I'd love to see one big splash announcement or two, I think that it's going to go, you know, come through. 50 jobs here, 100 jobs there, 15 jobs here. Um, and we just look up over after a, you know, a year or two and we see some actually some pretty positive growth that comes from that. And, uh, you know, Houston has that incubator um, that is capable of, of, of really being hospitable to, to companies of that size. And, and, and clearly you're seeing a lot of people flocking to Houston. Talked about that population growth earlier. Um, a lot of those are job creators that are doing that. Um, and, and what's interesting, if you look at Houston kind of on the on the grand scheme of things, um, and if you look at what has been the biggest threat to our country, right? Um, you know, overall, you know, it obviously it's a conventional military attack, and then it and then it evolved kind of into these terrorist attacks uh, after 9/11. Well, nothing has brought us to our knees faster than this pandemic. And so you can bet that at a national level, at a state level, billions of dollars are going to be poured into biotech research, life sciences, and where, you know, what is what does Houston have? I mean, Houston is 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 the hotbed for a lot of that. Um, so I think that Houston's going to receive a disproportionate amount of a lot of that research funding uh, because we're the infrastructure here to house that. Um, so that could be something that comes into play that you and I really can't ca calculate today on, you know, January 25th, 26th. Um, but I think that that could have a pretty good impact going forward. It, it is, you know, a thing for growth. We see what's going on around the Texas Medical Center, the TMC3. Yep. And then Heinz is doing the, the redevelopment of the, you know, the grocery supply site there into kind of a health sciences oriented mixed use development with 50 acres it's huge you know maybe yeah. this or something, I don't know. But, so the, you're right there's a lot of potential there yeah um, uh, let's for a second let, let's talk about some of these other markets around I know you're really strong in Texas you're founded in Texas in Austin well, man they've gotten a lot of pub lately <laughs> Elon Musk moving there and and you know, the headquarters of Oracle, um, so, so much growth. And then, and, and they're talking about the, I guess the latest recently, the, the talk that um, Samsung was going to build a, a chip manufacturing a $10 billion. And I read last night, well, 10 billion may not be right. It may be 17 billion, a huge, huge chip manufacturing plant, the biggest in, you know, this in a very, up to date in terms of its modern advances and, and those all these kind of this job growth galore the big tesla plant there uh under construction um tons of growth all over the place um saw last night some guys uh, proposing to build a 64 story building mixed use building in downtown um so it's really growing that's when you start to get nervous right 
<laughs> whenever the the announcements made on a building that's you know of a size that's never been seen before in a city, we've seen that play out before, haven't we? Yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty. But I, I've I've got I've seen it. I've seen the he's put out official press release. How official that may be. Tell us a little bit about, and, and I know you've got a building there. You've got a very important building under construction there. The River South, the stream is building the River South project, which is just on the southern shore. It's downtown, of course, you know, the southern shore of the Colorado River there, you know, first and, and not far. And of course, all that south of the, on the south side yep. of the Colorado River, which runs through downtown. They've, all that's supposed to change the humongous Austin American Statesman site, which they're going to, they're vacating 20 acres at Congress Avenue in the river. That's primo stuff. And it's going to be a major development. And then there's your project, which is, uh, I think you've got a, a Baker Botts, if, if I recall, is a lead tenant uh, and it's coming along. That's right. Tell me, what do you think? What's tell me about Austin? It's super hot, and you guys are there. You know, super hot. I mean, it, what's interesting about Austin? It, it kind of reminds me um, of a of an article that I read in the Economist. It was a while back now, but it it pointed out that of all the Texas cities, it was Texas was very unique in terms of corporate relocations, unlike other parts of the of the country, where of the last 25 major corporate relocations, only one time, and that was AT&T, was that at the cost of another Texas city when AT&T left uh, San Antonio to go to Dallas. But each city within the state has clearly carved out its own niche uh, on the world stage of how we are you know, viewed. Obviously, Houston's been energy, healthcare. Um, Dallas has been banking of general corporate relocations. Austin has been all in on tech. Um, and so it's been receiving just a disproportionate amount of that demand. Um, when there's been an influx into the state, they go to Austin, right? Austin most closely resembles what, um, you know, they left out in California. And um, it is absolutely on a roll right now, like you said. And, you know, in addition, you know, Facebook's rumored to be taking another million square feet. Um, apparently Oracle's even talking about increasing the number of people to over 10,000 that would, that would come to Austin. So it's just one good bit of news after another. Um, so seeing that demand um, obviously caused us to, to get excited about, particularly in the urban infill locations where you're seeing a lot of this growth uh, to, to look at that Charles Schultz site with the views that you have over Lady Bird Lake and, uh, the great ingress egress and it just really kind of checked all the boxes for us. So yeah, we just finished on the 10th floor. Uh, it's a 15 story building, 350,000 square feet. will be the smartest building within Austin. Green roof has complete uh, capturing ability of all storm water. Um, so an incredibly green building and um, it's going to be pretty remarkable and uh, we're excited about it. It will deliver uh, first quarter of next year. So we're just about a year out. Like you said, Baker Botts has been the, um, that lease has been signed and that's been really the one that's uh, kind of kicked off everything. And um, we've received some really good interest as of late um, on some of the remaining balance of the building. Obviously for, you know, most of 2020, like like leasing across the country, it was, um, you know, it was a little bit stalled. But uh, now that we're seeing a little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel with vaccines being distributed and uh, presidential election having come to an end and whatnot. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more tenant activity there. Yeah, Preston, you know, that, that site uh, where their building was owned by Charles Schultz family, yep. you know, the cartoonists that did peanuts. And uh, so that's, it's, but it was a great asset that he bought and, and um, I'm sure that he sold it to you for a lot more, and he, he paid for it when he bought it years ago. I'm sure he did. <laughs> he, he I'm was, sure he did. But yep. it's good. It's a great location, a number one location. Uh, and, and I'm interested to see how that south side goes, and you know the newspaper side, of course, so it's happening everywhere. Yep. 
the Houston Chronicle sites now being developed by Heinz. Uh, yeah, the Antonio Express News site is in play near just not a couple of blocks from the Alamo, really, you know, three blocks. And it's happened in Dallas. And, you know, it, it's everywhere across the nation. Um, these urban newspaper facilities are plants, you know, they were, they had printing and ink and 18 wheelers bringing in loads of paper and stuff. They, they, a lot of those have uh, gone to the suburbs and are not, not taking as much space or not as prominent. And so it's uh, amazing how many of those have changed over. Um, we just think about it. I mean, you look at even today, I mean, you know, any, anything tied to the communications industry is, is, you know, at Maine and Maine in any major city. Obviously a lot of that's now tied to broadcasting and telecom mm -hmm. and, and tech companies, but that's what the newspaper industry was when a lot of those sites were established hundred, hundred years ago, 50 years ago. And so uh, it's now giving way to that next form of communication. And um, it's it, like you said, it's playing out because they, they had really the ideal site in a lot of these cities. Miami Herald site. They're overlooking Biscayne Bay. That's yeah, that's gone, and you know, it's it's been demolished and being redeveloped. Yeah, but also in Austin, you know, the other thing that uh, Stream reportedly is, uh, uh, I know people that went to school there and, and everything remember Sixth Street and all the clubs and uh, bars along there, you know, packed with with young people and others and all the time in in the olden days and still is to some extent uh, i guess but i know that there's been reports that uh, your firm's been you know, blocking up uh, doing an assemblage along there and acquiring a, a quite a bit of uh, retail sites and bar sites and old commercial buildings all along that sixth street corridor so. mm -hmm. That's that's got a lot of that's got a lot of features. It's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. I've been wondering, you know, what what your vision is for that in the long term. Yeah, you know, I think it's the the old adage that Mark Twain said. You know, buy land. They're not making any more of it. <laughs> and uh, we've we've always been big believers in Austin. You know, clearly a lot of us sitting here in Texas have known that Austin's a special place long before a lot of others in the country did. Um, and so we've been heavily invested in that city and I think we'll continue to do so. And you just look at the real estate, look at the proximity to a lot of the um, place making uh, spaces within downtown Austin. You look at uh, the residential resurgence in downtown Austin. You look where a lot of people want to live, the walkable amenities. It, it just, again, it checks all those boxes. And so by having a good, um, you know, handle of the real estate within a certain area of proximity to all of that, you've got options. Um, so I, I can't look you in the eye right now and say, hey, look, here's exactly what our plan is, you know, for the next five or 10, 20 years. Um, but we know that um, just by sheer history that, you know, being able to kind of tie up land, land sites like that will portend to good things down the road. Um, so that's well, kind of how we're approaching it. Do what? <laughs> It worked for Charles Schultz, so uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure it will work for Stream too. It, it worked really well for him. <laughs> but, uh, what about DFW? That, that's oh man! Every time I turn around, you know, Steve Brown, the real estate writer at the Dallas Morning News. You know, I've known him for a long time. It seemed like for a while there, it's like every other week he's writing a story about. But here's another million square foot corporate campus, and you know. It's, Boom, boom, boom. This major um, Charles Schwab company relocating from California, uh, State Farm Insurance, Corla a lot of corporate relocations going to Dallas. They've really, they've done a marvelous job in attracting companies. Uh, wait, what's, what's going on in the, the Dallas market? Yeah, Dallas, Dallas has been on fire as well. I think, you know, we've got to remember that we're in a little bit of a vacuum here in Houston where, you know, the world for us collectively locally changed in late 2015 um, when, you know, the news uh, started coming out with OPEC and, and that leading to energy prices doing what they've done. Uh, but the rest of the country really hasn't looked back um, and, you know, have 
probably one of the longest bull market periods within U.S. history now since the, the Great Recession, 2009. So, uh, you know, nine, ten solid years of just really solid growth. And you look at, uh, you know, just at the, the largest winners within uh, the country, Texas stands at the very top of that list in terms of that corporate migration. And, you know, in Dallas and Austin have certainly got more of their fair share. Uh, what's interesting with with Dallas is, you know, that that MSA is so large that, um, you know, you, you got to look not just at Dallas County, but you got to look at Tarrant County. You got to look at Collin County um, and, and really see where a lot of that growth is going uh, particular. And so you kind of have a little bit of a tale of two cities and by no means are they diverging in terms of their fundamentals. But, you know, the core of Dallas, Uptown. Uh, that's continuing to grow, but it's really just kind of growing organically. Whereas a lot of that inbound business is going into the Plano's and Frisco locations in far North Dallas, but, but it's just been absolutely super white hot as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, there's uh, Dallas is number one in family construction and, and Houston's right behind it. Right. A lot of homes being built, a lot of, you know, in dust warehouse buildings being built, uh, it's 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 really strong. Of course, we're getting we're getting that here in Houston. Also, we're getting, we're getting plenty, of, plenty of single family, plenty of warehouses. It's just our office market's not so hot. Right. Uh, and I know that. You, uh, talk to me just a second about you know your your company. It seems like it's in an expansion mode in terms of geographic footprint, entering new cities. Um, and I know you're you have, you know, Southern California, DC, Chicago, and, and yeah, I think it's a total of 12 cities. And right That's now, right. Well, tell me more about your vision for expanding your company. Where, where yeah, I think that, you know, for us, it's, you know, it's follow the people. You know, that's probably the, the, the simplest strategy. And if you look at, you know, for instance, like the ULI recent emerging trends report in the, in the top locations, you know, it, in addition to the, a lot of the Texas cities, you know, it's the triangle region of North Carolina, it's Nashville, um, it's Charlotte, Phoenix, locations like that. And so um, continuing to kind of build out our presence um, within the Sun Belt, we really want to be in Florida at some point very soon as well you know, for the same reasons. Um, and then on top of that, continuing to populate the cities, the large financial centers, just because we feel that long-term, you know, those are going to continue to be in fine and continue to be a, uh, a nucleus for large, you know, conduction of commerce and large business activity. And so, you know, like you mentioned, we, we, we have a, a good presence now in Chicago. We've really increased our presence in Washington, D.C., over the last several years and, and, you know, at some point aspirationally would like to be in San Francisco, New York, and even possibly Seattle. Um, and so it's, it's just being very selective. As you know, we, we place a major emphasis in our culture. Um, and so it's really, really keenly on finding the right people and team um, in each individual situation, rather than just trying to get dots on a map as quickly as possible. We're a private company. There's no, outsider shareholder pressure to, you know, achieve certain growth metrics, you know, each and every quarter. Um, we're going to do things deliberately and we're going to do things on our own time frame um, that makes sense. Um, but with that being said, given given everything that's been going on with, with the pandemic, particularly in the office side, uh, you know, the opportunity cost uh, is as low as it's ever been for people to switch firms. Uh, to to change, you know, the locations they're currently at because it's not like they've got seventy five deals in the pipeline right now, um, and so that's brought a that's brought a lot of conversations, and and I, I think twenty one is going to be a pretty exciting year for us. It does seem like a lot of movement in terms of you know broke uh, moving to different companies, and uh, I've seen just a lot of personnel announcements here at the end of the year. That you know, very established people picking up and replanning with another group. It's, it's, I can't remember seeing more, but I, I guess it's happened. There's a lot, a lot of movement of major 
experience and personnel from one company to another. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, uh, I kind of liken it to my to-do list. I had this, you know, to-do list of things that I someday would like to read or accomplish or practice. And um, I looked at that list in July of last year. And I said, look, if I haven't done it now, then I'm never going to do it. I'm completely out of excuses given that, you know, that lockdown that we were all on for a certain period of time. And I think a lot of people are looking at that with their career right now, where it's, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm, if I've ever aspirationally wanted to take this next step or actually, or experience, you know, try this company or, or get into this segment of real estate, um, if there ever was a time to, to make that leap, now is the time to do it. it and I think that's even more the case outside of Houston, just because, you know, markets like Dallas and Austin, you know, people were having record years year after year for the last several years in terms of their own production. And so as, as much as they wanted to maybe make a move, it just didn't make any sense at all financially to do that. Um, and that, that, that came to a screeching halt uh, late first quarter of last year. And so a lot of those types of uh, thoughts have been bubbling up across the country. Yeah, it could lead to some major innovation. And, uh, oh, for sure. People that, hey, yep. I've always wanted to try to do this and I'm going to start a company and whatever, or, uh, see what see what I can do because not, nothing's going on. Absolutely. <laughs> what I hear is, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the people that lease office space for a building, for uh, for example, uh, it's been kind of a tough year on the revenue side for them because uh, this is what's the way it's been described to me uh, you're on top of it every day but a lot of the big companies that lease space and and they they're kind of frozen they they don't aren't making decisions they're putting things off and because they don't know what happens next you know how much work from home are we going to end up doing finally whatever you know talk to me about that you know, what what people are what companies are thinking decision makers one of our one of our clients put it best he said in a, in a good market the ceo gets the limelight in a bad market it's the cfo in a <laughs> pandemic it's hr <laughs> and, and uh and so you, you look at you know really for every company kind of up until maybe the middle part of the summer in all 50 states everybody was on lockdown of some, some degree. Um, and then I think, you know, what, what we have seen since that point is, you know, I guess the easiest way I can put it is that the company's willingness to go back to work varies inversely with their balance sheet. Hmm. And so the larger the company, the less willing they're wanting to go back to work because it's all a function of just mitigating risk right now hmm. for the smaller companies that are in survival mode, they don't have that luxury. Their balance sheet's not that big. They're not sitting on, you know, years of cash that can, uh, you know, sustain any type of burn rate that uh, might might come their way. They've got to get back to work. Um, and so that that's being reflected in the, the leasing volumes that we're seeing right now. It's a lot of small tenant activity, a lot of uh, short-term commitments. Um, a lot of the large companies are just choosing to, to just kind of sit on their hands right now, just because they've got such a large balance sheet for them. Um, the, the threat of lawsuits and the risk associated with that's far greater than, you know, missing another quarter of, of people physically being in their office. Um, so I think that, you know, what, what we envision seeing is, is, is a, a relatively subdued first half of 21, um, just given again, everything that's going on with COVID and the spike in the numbers, but as we've seen, uh, kind of greater distributed distribution of the vaccine and, um, you know, uh, getting back into the summer months. And I think we'll, we'll steadily see a, a more of a return to normalcy. Um, you know, work from home has been an interesting debate. I've been debating that for, uh, nine solid months now. I'm happy to go to the mat with anybody on it. Maybe we dedicate an entire podcast to that at some point, but uh, I just think that it, it bears out now that, you know, if you want to have a culture 
Um, if you want to, if you, if your employees are really focused on networking, training, mentorship, collaboration, you have to have, have a physical setting to do that. Um, and if you just look at other elements of your life or your kids' lives, and, um, and you're seeing the the yearning to get back, whether it's in school physically, where you've seen schools, you know, completely say, hey, look, for the next semester, we're not even offering a remote learning option because it's been such a disaster for our administrators, for our teachers, for our students. Um, whether you're seeing it with these Zoom cocktail hours that, you know, were real popular for 30 days before everybody scrapped those. If you're seeing the, the virtual uh, elements not working at all in other facets of our life, why do we suggest that it's going to be that way in business where things are even more competitive? Uh, and so people are tolerating working from home. Certainly flexibility is going to be added into the workspace going forward. And I think as a recruiting way, recruiting, former recruiting, maybe we, you see more of a hybrid model going forward where every other Friday, maybe you can work from home because you can get by one day a week or one day every other week working from home. But for that to be the absolute backbone of how companies are going to be run, again, for most people, it's not going to work. Um, you know, depending on what you read, we saw five to 12% of people working from home prior to uh, this pandemic. Um, I think we'll continue to see that, maybe see certain uh, elements of that kind of bump up. But uh, what it's really going to cause, though, is, is companies to really reflect more on how they want to optimize their, their real estate. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting. Um, we've even seen companies come to us and, and say they need more space because the narrative that oftentimes isn't being discussed right now is, um, you know, wow, over the last 15 years, our, our corporate density has gone from two and a half per thousand to four and a half per thousand. We really need to rethink whether that's smart or not um, to, you know, we really want to foster more collaboration and, and create more conference space for collaboration. Um, as a result, we need to consensually take more down, more space that way. There's a lot of that kind of being talked about right now. Yeah, you would um, think also stuff, but people don't want to be packed into an office building, an office space, workspace, you know, five feet from somebody. They, I think there's going to be, I think the people are going to realize, and, and they're very going to be very conscious of the fact that, hey, People do get sick, and when they sneeze on you, it's a bummer. I don't want to be close. Yeah. To you know? So I think that it will that less density is is going to be a popular thing in, in office space. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, when you start looking at the um, you know, these big corporate mandates, particularly with ESG and you know the health and wellness of employees, is paramount to that, and and what you just mentioned. Um, dovetails right into that whole ESG push. So I, I think you're right. I think we'll we will see a de-densification um, within the uh, office sector in some varying degrees, certainly, but um, definitely not a push towards greater density. Maybe we start calling it free range office. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah. What you guys are building. Uh, you know, several buildings around the country. Uh, what about this, the, the the methods of what you're putting in the buildings? Uh, you know, the the air conditioning, ventilation. Um, you know, you, maybe people you have empty ways where you don't have to touch the doorknobs all as much. Just things like that. That the health and wellness that you mentioned in, in terms of physical structures. Uh, What's what's happening now? That I mean, right there in Austin, you've got a perfect example. You've you've had a chance to adapt uh, with uh, since the building broke ground and uh, as it's been going along construction, and then COVID pops out. And, uh, what's what's the latest on this physical uh, changes that you're making to to buildings right now as you build them or plan them, design them? Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, that's certainly an evolving thing, and that has just taken kind of a rocket ship type of uh, um, you know trajectory over the last 
several quarters, given everything that's going on with the pandemic. I think at the top of that list is touchless everything, um, whether that's touchless entry, going to your touchless elevator bank where within your cell phone, you've got a pre-programmed card that goes to your destination dispatch elevator that just opens and takes you to your pre-assigned floor without having to touch the call button, without having to touch the elevator uh, floor button. Um, so that type of technology is already underway right now. Um, you know, certainly a huge look right now into the HVAC systems. Obviously, that's much more of an investment. And so people are really wanting to see just from the these increased filters or, um, you know, sanitation methods, if you're getting the bang for the buck, if it's really doing what, um, you know, it's being promised. So there's a lot of, a lot of analysis kind of being done on that. But I think certainly overall, you're you're looking at a lot of these HVAC methods be overhauled, um, whether that's from a, you know, uh, infrastructure creation standpoint or from a maintenance standpoint in terms of, you know, changing out the filters more frequently, inserting certain things within the system that can, uh, like UV filters and whatnot, in addition to what the system is already doing. But, you know, those are clearly the two major points of, uh, uh, of focus right now, going touchless and on the HVAC. Okay. Um, well, uh, anything else we need to you you have for uh, we need to think about today? Uh, you, uh, yeah. Anything else I should be asking you? Yeah. Before we close here. But, uh, uh, nothing. That, nothing that comes to mind. But um, you know, I'm happy to hop on one of these again at some point and, and we can bat around a few other topics. I think, I think over the next 45 or 60 days, just as this vaccine gets more widely distributed and we get into some warmer months, I think hopefully we'll, we'll be in a position where we can talk about much more actionable trends. I mean, I think we saw this particularly in Texas with, you know, the waning months of summer, uh, getting into the fall I and mean, we were getting back to, uh, um, you know, to normal pretty quickly before we saw that spike in numbers. And I think we'll continue. I think we'll see that play out again here in the second quarter in Texas in particular. Well, we'll I think you're right. I think the, uh, we'll see the vaccination uh, getting this behind us is a huge deal and it, it will happen eventually. And hopefully it'll happen this year and uh, we'll have to have you back and, we can take a look back and see how it actually did turn out. So, but Preston, That's right. Green Realty, thank thank you so much for being on the show today, and we'll uh, we'll uh, talk again soon.